down. He's at a conference. And um, this brand new podium we have here was built with pastor. And my pastor's kind of tall, you know. And so Bob's taking his place today. And you're not quite so tall. So um, just trying to figure out where you want to preach from, Bob. <laughs> you want it over here or? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> moment in this church, I'm telling you. I'll tell you. I'm not on? Oh, okay. Newfangled stuff I got wrapped around my ears and everything else. How about that? Am I on now? All right. All right. As I said before, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Uh, and just being somebody that, that says, hey, uh, the church is worthwhile. We need to be here. We need to uh, be in God's Word. We had a good Sunday school class this morning. Um, so it's it's important that we do these things and, and that we show up for church and, and show up for the things that, uh, that God wants us to, to learn, to be in wisdom and knowledge, to know wisdom and knowledge, to understand wisdom and knowledge. If we don't understand this Word of God, when we come into the world and they start answering, a- asking us questions, it's going to be difficult if we don't know the Word of God and we don't know where to go. So my prayer is that we do that. I'm going to be talking this morning. Uh, I give a little bit of this in my Sunday school class a, a long time ago. But uh, it's going to be on the, uh, the natural man. Uh, in his basic condition. And this is what we're seeing more and more. And I know I keep bringing up the jail, but that's my life. Okay, that's where I'm at. I'm there every week. I'm, uh, I preach there every week for three and a half hours. And uh, I'm getting too old to do that. I'm hoping that more people will come along. Side, it takes a, a lot of energy to do that. But I'm seeing more and more. I try to put together things that, that I see that... Uh, the book of Proverbs, we're in our Sunday school class, we've been doing the book of Proverbs. It's really been a joy to me to do that because the book of Proverbs points you. It points you in a direction that you need to go. It lets you understand why you're doing the things that you're doing. It lets you understand why the world is doing the things that they're doing. And so this morning, I want to, uh, I want to, to be preaching on the, the natural man and his basic condition and... Uh, and everybody knows him. Everybody knows the natural man. He's okay. I can walk down the street into, an, into uh, Holly's, the restaurant in town, and say, how you doing, John? He said, I'm going to do it okay. And I can sit down with John at that table and eat breakfast, and in five minutes he's got more problems than United Nations. Okay? But he's okay. But he's got more problems than the United Nations. So one of the things that I wanted to... Uh, I want to start out this morning is about the church, and I'd like to go, if you would, go to Acts chapter 2. You won't have this up there, but Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 40, 47, and I want to read this. This is the first church, the very first church, okay? And this is what the believers, uh, they form a community in this first church. And it's, it's all about ordinary things that we do, ordinary things that we do in life. It's not rocket science. It's very ordinary. And I want to read this to you. It says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to pray. Well, that don't seem very hard, does it? Seems like it's a very simple day. And then it says, a deep sense of awe came over them all. This is what I like about this. Because when I walk in them doors, and I do it several times a week, I'm in awe. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of this church. What this church does. 
The people that this church has put out as missionaries that have been all over the world. I come in here in awe. I always tell my men when we sing songs like that, the river, special song to me, very special song to me. But when we, when we sing songs in the jail, it's already a message. I wish I could sing three songs. We can't do it anymore because time constrains us of doing that. But when you're singing, it's already a message. Those songs are messages to us. But it says here, a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those who were in need. Now, this doesn't mean, listen to me, they went out and everybody and that, everybody that was a new Christian sold their house because then nobody had no place to live, right? What they did is they had things that they didn't need. I looked in my, I was telling Karen, I looked out into my, my, my huge buildings that I have on my farm and I got this big, huge, you know, tractor, John Deere. I've got all the, and this is what they did. The extra that they had, the extra that they had, they sold so that y'all could have what they had. It was a marvelous thing that they did back then because there was a lot of people who were hurting. But they sold what, whatever they had extra so that everybody could be in the same place that I'm in with my house. Amen? It's great stuff. And then it says, they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. They could be happy because everybody was equal. If you were hurting, what are you hurting about? I've got something here. Yeah, I can make you happy today. I can share with you. And each day, the Lord, this is what I like. <laughs> when you see this kind of stuff happening in a church, this is what happens. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. He says, I found a place, I found a place that I need to send people because these people in this place, in this church, Grace Bible Church, they know how it works. They give, and they give, and they give more. How did they do that? How did they form that community? They devoted themselves to four things. I just read them. They devoted themselves to four things. You want to make this church grow? Here's what we do. They devoted, to, they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's what you're doing now. You're listening to me give you the Word of God. That's what they were doing. You just listen to me give you the Word of God. And then to fellowship. I've never seen a church like this as fellowship. I, and, and, and Karen and myself have been to other churches preaching, helping some churches out that their pastors are retiring and leaving and that type of thing. And we go there. This church here is the most fellowshipping church there is. We can end this thing at, at, uh, at 12 o'clock and at 12.30 we're still talking and fellowshipping. This is what they did too, okay? The apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the Lord's Supper. We have the Lord's Supper. Do this in remembrance of me. We do that. And prayer. Wednesday night, Prayer. I look over this church and I'm looking at some people right now that we prayed for. You're here and you're smiling. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? If there's nothing like prayer. Let me tell you something. You're missing out if you're not here on Wednesday night. There's nothing like it. And I'll tell you what, we'll bring you to prayer. Is something wrong with you? Had a bad test? Amen? That'll bring you to prayer meeting. But I ought to bring you to prayer meeting just for anything that this church needs and the church needs. A deep sense of awe came over them. I want people when they come to this church with a deep sense of awe, and that means a sense of, of just divine uh, presence, just a divine presence. God is here. And two or more are gathered in his name, he is here. 
A healthy Christian community attracts people to Christ. The healthier that we can we can be in this church, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna attract people to Christ. The Jerusalem church, church's zeal for worship and brotherly love was contagious. Everybody seen it and said, I want to go there. I want to go there. A healthy, loving church will grow in numbers. It will grow in numbers. We, we grow this church up and then we take them out. Okay? And they have to move. They have to go other different places. They're in Iowa. They're in Michigan. But boy, you mentioned Grace Bible Church. They say, that's a church. They're not afraid to say, that's a church I went to. Because they know we love them. We know we love every one of you. If you have any needs, we, we try to put everything together. If you need a counselor, we've got counselors here. If you, if you need something in your life, you need, you need cash, an emergency, or whatever, we have it here. We take care of our own. God takes care of His own, and this church takes care of its own. Amen? And some of you that I look around in this church, you've been a part of that. You've been a part of that. What are we doing to make your church the kind of place that will attract others to Christ? That's my point. We need to attract people. Now we need to understand some of the people that we're going to be attracting. And he's the common man, okay? He's the natural man. <laughs> i got to turn this thing over. I keep looking at that beer can. I'm like, okay, what are you doing here? <laughs> all right, all right. He's the natural man. He thinks he's okay. Um, and like I said, I'll sit down with him. Two or three minutes, they get more problems than the United Nations. But he thinks he's okay. That's the common man. That's what we have out in this world. He thinks he's okay. Proverbs 16.2. Got it up there already. People are pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. The Lord examines their motives. They're pure in their own eyes. Hey, it's okay. I'm okay. Oh, yeah, you did mention that. Well, I'm not okay there, you know. Oh, you did mention that. Yeah, I'm not okay there either. Uh, yeah, I got a problem there. But in their own eyes, before you mention anything, they're okay. I'm okay. People can rationalize anything. We can also prove we are right. I hear that a thousand times a year. I'm not guilty in the jail. Fifteen people have seen them do it, but I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. I'm okay. Proverbs 21.2 says, People may be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their heart. So he's going to examine your motives. What is your motives? And now he's going to examine your heart. You can't get away from God. I don't care who you are. He is watching you whether you're saved or you're not saved. You are his. He created you before the foundations of the earth. You were form he formed your bones in your mother's womb. You can't get anybody that's more intimate with you, not your wife, not your mother, not your dad, but Jesus Christ. He's the one that created you in your mother's womb. He knew you. If you've got something wrong with you, that's what I do when I go to the hospitals, when you've got something wrong, who's the one that can fix you? He's the one that who made you is Jesus Christ. In Proverbs 14, 12, there is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. The right choice often requires hard work and self-sacrifice. That's the right choice. It's not easy. Right choices aren't easy. Because the world says, no, don't do it that way. Come on, come on, Bob. Ain't nobody going to see you. You're in Ohio now. My Ohio people, where you at? I see you. You're in Ohio now. Ain't nobody going to see you here. So he thinks that everything is okay. Number two is, he does not understand his spiritual need. He doesn't understand, he thinks everything's okay, but now he doesn't understand his spiritual need. 
So I want to go to Luke. I want to go there. You don't have to go there. I just want to go to Luke 12, 31. <laughs> and I like this verse. Twelve thirty one, Luke. I'm, we're, we're on now. He he does not understand his spiritual needs. It says, "Seek ye the kingdom of God above all else." Are we doing that today? You got a lot of things on your plate this week. You got a lot of stuff on your plate this week. Everybody in here, including me. But this is what the word says. In thirty one. Seek ye, seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. Why are we not praying more? you got a week ahead of you that you do not know what's going to happen. I do not know either. There's many people that get on Route 70 today. They're getting on Route 70 to go to a destination. They will never be there. Amen? I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Prayer is so important. Proverbs thirty twelve. They are pure in their own eyes, but they are filthy and unwashed. This characterizes the present generation that we're, li- we're living in right now. They are pure in their own eyes, and yet not washed from filthiness. Who needs God? Who needs God? That's that's the thing that's coming out now on TV with the atheist program. A lot of the pastors are turning atheists now. They want everybody else to be atheists. I don't think they ever were. I don't think they ever knew Jesus Christ. And we're watching this, the pastor and myself. I'd like to I'd like to share something with you about the flood. Does everybody remember the flood in Noah? Sixteen there were sixteen hundred years. Between Adam and the flood. 1,600 years. That's a long time. And there was approximately, they don't know for sure, but there was approximately 300 to 400 million people on the earth. And they didn't understand their spiritual needs. What I, want you, what I want you to understand is, who needs God? It wasn't back then. Here's what the schools and, and, and some of the books that we have. We have this uh, prehistoric man who's got this club over his shoulder, and he's got his, his woman by the grab of the hair, and he's just walking with her and dragging her. That ain't what my Bible says. My, my Bible says 1,600 years They've advanced so much in 1,600 years that they didn't need God. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? They advanced 1,600 years. They didn't need God. God says, I'm done with you. Women, children, everything, gone. God don't play. God don't play. But do you have a question about anything in here today? I can answer it. I can answer it. Now you're going to ask me, how can I answer it? Google. <laughs> it's just Google. That's a, Why do I need God? Uh, how many people in here need friends? I, I can get you 15, 20 friends right now on Facebook. Okay? I told this to a bunch of young people at, at, at another church. You need a date? You need a date? Call dating. Call dating. You have one tonight. Who needs God? If you've got this thing, who needs God? What do you need to know? I can tell you. Makes me look really good. Do you want to go to your happy place? I like this. You want to go to your happy place? Everybody wants to go to their happy place. I've had a rough day. I want to go to... Turn to your music. This music will put you to a happy place. That's what it does. What I want you to know is this is fantasy life. Young people, listen to me. This is fantasy life. 
This is the real life that we're living in right now. This is fantasy life. This is the real life. And this is the most important thing right here. This is eternal life. Amen? Fantasy life. That's what, that's what Satan wants. And don't get me wrong. I have to have one of these, okay? Because my grandchildren talk me into this. <laughs> Got to blame it on somebody, don't you? I'm blaming it on my grandchildren. My grandchildren said, Grandpa, how are, we supposed to, how, how are we supposed to let you know where we're at and what we're doing and all our grades and everything else and we're having a good time? And I'll show you some pictures of what we're doing. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Okay, all right. So I carry this thing in my back pocket. <laughs> it hasn't broke yet, so I'm just still doing good. But I want you to understand fantasy life, the real life and eternal life. That's what I want you to see today. That's out there, out there. I'm going to tell you something. It's getting serious. We don't need God when we got something like this. What do you need today? I can find it for you. Need a boat? Ask me. I am the king of boat buyers. Had one for eight years and never put it in the water. <laughs> and not only that, I sold it for half price. I'm the king of boat buyers. If you want to know how to buy a boat, call me. I will let you know what to do and what not to do about buying a boat. So, he thinks he's okay, and he doesn't understand his spiritual life, and he is never truly satisfied. Wow. He's never truly satisfied. <laughs> I'm telling you. If I've made $10. I've made $20 an hour. I've made $35 an hour. And at the end of the week, that's what I made. No matter what you make, that's what you're going to spend. Amen? I worked from paycheck to paycheck, and it was amazing. I don't know how my, I don't know how my, my, my first wife, Pat, uh, I did it, you know, because I, all I did was go to work, and she'd say, here, here's some pendants. You, you, you make that last all week. And I'm like, where, where does all the rest of this money go? I had no clue. But she made it work. She made it work. Whatever you make, you're going to spend. Amen. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Unless you are really, really disciplined, whatever you make, that's what you're going to spend. Proverbs 27, 20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man will never be satisfied. He's never going to be satisfied. What I see, I want. I seen a boat, and I wanted a boat. I never put it in the water. That tells you something. Men are not satisfied because they seek that, because they seek what they cannot, um, sat, what cannot satisfy. They're always seeking something that can't that can't satisfy to them. That boat didn't satisfy me at all. I thought it would. I really thought it would. Only Christ can satisfy the soul. Amen? Amen? Only Christ can satisfy the soul. I want to turn to Ecclesiastes. We don't have it up there. Ecclesiastes 1. I want to read this to you. I got this the other day, and I really like this. Verses 8. <coughs> Excuse me. Verses 8 through 11. It says, everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we, never, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new. But actually, it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in the future generations, no one will remember what we are doing. It. Solomon, who wrote this, this book after his own, after he had tried everything and achieved much. Everybody knows that. 
only to find that nothing apart from God made him happy. He had everything, all the money he could eat, and every servant, he had everything you could think of, but nothing apart from God made him happy. And he wanted his readers that I just read to you, and you are a part of them readers now, he wanted his readers to avoid the same senseless pursuits. If we try to find meaning in our accomplishments rather than in God, we will never be satisfied. And everything we pursue will become meaningless. Everything. I tell my prisoners that if you don't have a plan when you leave this place, you're in this jail 24 sevens. You never leave. You take a bath, you take a shower once a week. You eat three times a day. You breathe in and you breathe out, and you don't do anything else. You will never make it. That is why they come back all the time. Because they do not have a plan. Every Christian should have a plan. And what he's going to do for the Lord, not himself. So he thinks he's okay. He doesn't understand spiritual needs. And he's never truly satisfied. He habitually sins. Number four. He habitually sins. Means doing something regularly or repeatedly, a habit. It's a habit. He uses shop talk all the time. It's just a habit. It just comes out. I'm sorry. You're around it 24, 20, not 24 sevens, but you're around it 10, 12 hours a day if you work in the world, okay? Proverbs 19.3. People run their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. You ever meet people like that? I've got a jail full of them and I've got some relatives of mine. They did things in life they shouldn't have done and they blame God. What did God do? God left them here to breathe another day. But they want to blame God. I can't, I can't blame. You ever find that out with people? When they do something wrong, they want to blame somebody else. They want to blame somebody else. And this is one of the things that, that we run into. People continually blame God for their self-induced problems. Instead of blaming God, <laughs> look for ways to grow through your, uh, through your bad choices and failures. Just look for another way. Instead of blaming Him. It's not Him. The reason that you are here is because of him. Your days are numbered. That's what the Word of God says. I didn't say that. The Word of God says your days are numbered. Watch out for that. I'm seven, turn 72 this month. My days are numbered. I'm on short term now. Insurance man wanted to sell me insurance. I'm like, mm, yeah, all right. You know, I'm 72. They want, they want a gazillion dollars to have it. And I'm on short term. So he habitually sends. And then point number five is, he is unable to remedy his condition. Boy, that's a good one, isn't it? He's unable now to remedy his own conditions that he's in. Why? Why is he unable to remedy the condition that he's in? Number one, he thinks he's okay. Number two, he doesn't understand his spiritual need. Number three, wow. He's never truly satisfied and number four, he habitually sins. That is why he is unable to remedy his condition. Proverbs 29. Who can say, I have cleansed my heart, I am pure and free from sin? Huh, who can say that? No one is without sin. As soon as we confess our sins and repent, simple thoughts start to creep back in. The, war, the problem that I have most of all, I stand up here in front, of, in front of you people and I preach to you on Sunday and I got to go out them doors. And when I go out them doors, the thoughts start coming back. I am no better than anybody else. And these are some of the things that, 
that uh, no one is without sin. We need ongoing cleansing. We need ongoing cleansing. Walk with God and ask for forgiveness as you're walking and talking with Him during the day. As I said many a times, when Karen's with me and we're driving by a hospital, I've been in a hospital most of my married life. And I pray for everybody in there, the doctors, the nurses. And I've got grandchildren. I've got a grandchild you know, that is a nurse. And I pray for the people in there. Because they're all counting on something else. Instead of counting on him, most of them. Some of them do. Amen for that. We need an ongoing cleansing moment by moment. Thank God He provides forgiveness by His mercy when we ask for it. And then there's the tragic end. His life will be full of trouble. Now, can we put them things back up again? His life will be full of trouble. Now why? You know, he, he can't He's not able to remedy his own conditions. But now, <laughs> this is the tragic end. His life will be full of trouble. That's what I have in the jail. If they don't get this before they leave, they're coming back. They're coming back. That's what I want to tell you people, that it, this is what happens. Wow. Why is his life full of trouble? Well, <laughs> he thought he was okay. That's why his life's full of trouble. He thought he was okay. He didn't understand his spiritual need. Is everybody getting this? Wow. He is never satisfied. He's never satisfied. He habitually sins. He is unable to remedy his condition, and that is why his life will be full of trouble. Proverbs 22, 5, Corrupt people walk a thorny, treacherous road. Whoever, whoever values life will avoid it. Avoid places you shouldn't be. My prisoners do not do that. They leave the jail and go back to the homies that got them in jail. You can't do that. People say, Bob, how do you know that person knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? I'll tell you how I know the, the people that I meet know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. It's because the way they talk, the way they act, the way they walk. I'll tell you why. The way they talk about Jesus all the time, that's how I know. You can't be silent when you've been cured from dying and will have everlasting life. Amen? You can't. It's impossible. You must learn these things. You must learn about the natural man. What his problems are. Proverbs 17.20 The crooked heart will not prosper. The lying tongue trembles into trouble. The lying tongue trembles into trouble. Which would you rather trust? Who would you rather trust? I want to put this question out to you. I think I've done this before. Who would you rather trust, a thief or a liar? I'm going to tell you what I trust. You don't have to answer it. I'll answer it for you, for me. I trust the thief every time. You know why? Because he'll steal from me. Amen? Amen? That's what a thief does. He steals from you. I never trust a liar. Never trust a liar. Because you don't know what they're going to say, what they're going to do, what's going to happen to them, how they'll change things. And you never know where you're going to be with them. So we must understand that. We must understand that. And then his way will end in eternal death. This guy has no hope. He has no hope. His, his way is going to end up in eternal death. If I'm not giving you a reason to evangelize your family, your immediate family, and the family of this church today, I've missed the mark. 
Proverbs 29, 18. When people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. Boy, we're seeing that today, aren't we? If you're not looking into this word and you're not going to church and you're not going to Sunday school, I want to tell you something. You're going to be hell on wheels. You're going to be running it. We see it in the schools. You can't, you can't even get these, these kids to settle down. There's no word of God in them at all. You've got to accept divine guidance. And that comes from the church reading the word of God. If not... I guarantee you, like I do my prisoners, you'll run wild. You'll run wild. And what happens when you run wild? Our television sets are full of it today. You get shot and you die. And not only you, maybe your son, maybe your daughter. Divine guidance refers to the Word of God where there is ignorance, or rejection of God, crime and sin run rampant. There's, I don't think anybody in here will question me on that. People must know God's way and keep His rules. Having God's Word means little if we don't obey it. If we don't obey His Word, it means little to anyone. And last... The believer's response to to the natural man. What is our response? I said all this about the natural man, which is not good. To make a point, what is our job? What is our response to the natural man? I would like for you to go to Proverbs, if you'll turn with me. Proverbs 24. I don't know if we got that up there or not, do we? Oh, yes, we do. All right, my man. Thank you. I didn't know where I put that up or not. This is what our response. Warn him of his helpless condition. This is what we have to do. We have to warn people. That's why I go to the jail. I go to the jail to warn people. Hey, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. But if you do this, I'll see you in glory. Amen? I don't get them all. I don't get them all. But I get the ones that he wants me to get to. Many a times we go into that jail. We're going to be singing a song here at last. This song was introduced into jail about three months ago. It is the number one hit song, The River. We already sung it once. We're going to sing it again. It's called The River. I've seen men fall to their knees. And my partner, who is Mike March, I was telling some of the men in the office, the pastor's office, before I came out. He's never seen anything like that. He's never seen the Spirit of God fall in a place. Maybe some of you haven't here either. But when you do, you'll never forget it. Because you know it's the Spirit of God. And he falls on a place. You see, I don't know. See, when I go to the jail, I have... (laughs) Karen knows this. She prays with me every time before I go. She lays hands on me and prays for me. I so appreciate that. Because, see, I can, only, I can only preach what God told me to preach that week. When I read the Word of God and He gives me something to preach. I don't know what those guys need when I'm going in there. I come here to preach today. I don't know what your needs are here today. But I know everybody in here has got a lot of needs. But I don't know them. But, see, He does. And through His Word that I preach... Hearts are changed. Lives are changed. Not because of me. Because of Him and the Word of God. Amen? That ought to encourage you. That ought to encourage you. It says, Rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Very sa- This is a very... This is what the guys in the jail like this. Rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Save them as they stagger to their death. Don't excuse yourself by saying, look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts and he sees you. He understands all hearts, but he sees you. Okay? Wow. He who guards your soul knows you knew. 
He will repay all people as their actions deserve. That's the part that scares me to death. He will do that. So we're to warn, we're warn, we're to warn them of their helpless condition. And the last one I have here is encourage him to turn to God, Proverbs 11.30. I'm going to turn to Proverbs 11.30 here because it says on my notes, see note, and I will do that. Proverbs 11.30. There it is. The seed of good deeds become a tree of life. A wise person wins friends. Now the most in my Bible I want to read to you. Like a tree attracts people to its shade. A wise person's sense of purpose attracts others who want to know how they too can find meaning. Do you realize, Christians, listen to me, how many people walk around you and say, wow, I wish I could be like that. I don't know what he's got, but I really want it. Do you know how many times that's told to me in the jail? I don't know what you got, Mr. Smooster, but I want it. How do I get it? Because they see, they see your actions. And it says, gaining wisdom yourself can be the first step in leading people to God. Gaining wisdom. How do you gain wisdom? You open up this word right here. You open up this word and you start reading it. That's the only wisdom you need. I remember the first church that I they were asked they asked me to speak in, <laughs> and it was actually really funny because when I got there, all the all the elders and deacons met me at the front door. <clears throat> I tell this story, and I'll end with this. And you singers can come up if you want to. Um, they met me at the front door. They took me in this room with a great big round table in it, you know, and uh, so. I went in there, you know, and they sent me down. They said, well, Mr. Spoonster, um, what book did you write? And I thought, man, oh, man, I better check and make sure I'm in the right church. I said, I never wrote a book. He said, well, what's your 12-point what's your plan or your 8-point plan? I said, I, I, I don't have no 12-point plan, no 8-point plan. I said, the only, book, the only book that I got is this book right here. Amen. That's the only one I read. They said, well, <laughs> you're going to like this one. They said, um, well, we only want you to speak 15 minutes. Well, I got up from the table, I got my Bible, and I started to leave. And they're like, oh, oh hold on, Mr. Spooner, where are you going? I said, I don't speak 15 minutes. My people in my church know that. <laughs> Amen. Oh, well, okay, okay, Uh, we can work this out, we can work this out. And he says, uh, we don't give an invitation at our church. I got my Bible up and I started heading for the door again. Like, oh, Mr. Spooster, wait a minute, no, what's wrong with that? I said, why am I going to preach my heart out through the Word of God and to these people and let them know that there's a Savior out there that they can come to and I'm not going to ask them, to come forward and accept him? You got the wrong guy. So I, and I asked him, I asked everyone there. I said, do you all check, you know, who you invite to come preach at your church? You need to start checking into who you invite to come preach at your church. Because I do give an invitation. And let me tell you what happened. There was a guy in the very back of the church. Recently got a divorce. Had his little baby. He was sitting in the chair, rocking his baby. My whole sermon, I was watching him. I gave the invitation. The man got up. 
started walking down that aisle with that baby. And there wasn't a dry eye in that church. Amen? They seen. They seen what God can do. What God can do. We're going to be singing a song here. It's called The River. Very special song to me. This song, The River, is an imitation. And I'm asking you, if you got any care at all, you got any, I don't want anybody coming in here and leaving with the same thing. I want it different. I want it different. Don't be embarrassed to come up here and give what you, what you have on your heart to Him. Not to me. To Him. Give it to Him. Don't leave here without that. If you don't know Jesus Christ, get up here. You need to be up here. You've got problems in your family. You've got needs. You've got problems. You come up here and give them to Him. That's why we do what we do. That's why we come here and we praise Him. Because of what He does for us in our life. Amen? Let's sing this song.